Mystery Murder in Room 1046, published May 22, 1943. Too many clues spoiled a broth, so the police of Kansas City, Missouri, might have parodied the old adage on that morning, some eight years ago, when the curtain rose on one of the strangest murder mysteries in the annals of American crime. At 7 a.m. on January 4, 1935, the switchboard operator of the hotel president prepared to call room 1046 in accordance with the instructions left by the occupant, who had registered on New Year's Day as Ronald T. Owen, Los Angeles, California. As she picked up the plug, the red light over 1046 blinked on, indicating that Mr. Owen had removed the receiver from the hook, presumably to inform her he was already awake. But no response to her repeated, good mornings, came from the other end of the line. Perhaps Mr. Owen had inadvertently knocked the receiver from its cradle in his sleep, she thought, and dispatched a bellboy. In answer to his knock, a gruff voice responded, and the boy returned downstairs. At 8.30, the phone in 1046 was again off the hook. Discovering the door locked from the outside, the bellhop entered with a passkey. The blinds were drawn, the room dark, and he was surprised to see the shadowy, nude form of Owen sprawled on the bed, face to the wall. The bellboy, believing Owen intoxicated, replaced the phone, which had fallen from its stand, and tiptoed out. At 11.13, the same thing was repeated. This time, the bed was empty. The bellboy raised the blind and froze. A chair was overturned. The telephone sprawled on the floor. The bedclothes were in a rumpus, and everywhere, on sheets, pillows, wall, were crimson stains, blood. The bathroom door was ajar. Seated on the edge of the tub, a stalwart figure, stripped, clung with scarlet hands to the washstand. Shoulders, chest, abdomen were slashed and bleeding. The back of his head was crushed. His throat was gashed. Blood pumped from a stab wound above his heart. House doctor and detective summoned by the bellboy's wails found Owen still conscious. The detective knelt over him. Who did this, Mr. Owen? Nobody, he whispered. What happened? I fell against the bathtub, he mumbled, and collapsed. He died, 18 hours later, without regaining consciousness. Meantime, a police squad rushed to the hotel, discovered that not a single article of Owen's remained in the room. His clothing, traveling kit, toothbrush, everything was gone. The door key, too, was missing. The telephone and a broken tumbler yielded smudged fingerprints, apparently a woman's. They could not be traced. Guests in an adjoining room reported hearing visitors in 1046 around midnight. The voices indicated two couples. They thought around 2 a.m. a quarrel developed. Then at 4, there was a sound like drunken snoring. The night elevator man recalled taking up to the 10th floor a woman who inquired for 1046. A half hour later, she descended to the lobby. An hour after that, she returned with a man and went up to the 9th floor. This couple departed the hotel around 4. So did a gentleman carrying a Gladstone bag. The inquest established that Owen had been attacked, but the identity or involvement of the nocturnal visitors could not be determined. His slayers had tortured Owen cruelly. Why? And why had he refused to name them? And who was Owen? Los Angeles authorities advised of the murder were unable to find any records of such an individual. A maid in the hotel said that on the afternoon of the second Wednesday, she had entered 1046 and found Owen sitting with the shades drawn in semi-darkness. Leave the door unlocked. I'm expecting a friend, he told her and walked out looking worried. Returning later with fresh linen, she found him lying on the bed in the still darkened room. The following morning, she found the door locked from the outside and let her side in with the passkey to make up the bed. To her surprise, there sat Owen, fully dressed in the dark. He told her to go ahead with her work. Presently, the phone rang, and she heard Owen say, "'No, Don, I've had my breakfast.' I don't care to go out. Obviously, then, Owen was being held a prisoner and in a situation in which he did not dare attempt escape or appeal for help. 
On March 3, 1935, the local papers carried an announcement that Owen's body was to be buried in Potter's Field. Hardly was the story on the street when the phone rang in one of the city's editorial rooms. You have a story in your paper that is wrong, a woman's voice said. Ronald Owen will not be buried in a pauper's grave. Arrangements have been made for his funeral. Who are you? queried the startled editor. Who's calling? Never mind. I know what I am talking about. What happened to Owen at the hotel? He got into a jam, was the laconic answer, punctuated by the receiver's click. Meantime, don't bury Owen in a pauper's grave, a man's voice instructed McGillie's undertaking parlors. I want you to bury him in Memorial Park Cemetery. Then he will be near my sister. I'll send funds to cover the funeral expenses. Who is this? I'll have to report this to the police. That's all right, Mr. McGilly. The undertaker was assured. In answer to another question, the voice explained that Owen had jilted a girl he'd promised to marry. The speaker had witnessed the jilting. The three had held a little meeting at the President Hotel. Cheaters usually get what's coming to them, he explained, and hung up. A little while later, the telephone rang in the office of the Rock Floral Company. I want 13 American Beauty Roses sent to Roland Owen's funeral, the anonymous caller said. I'm doing this for my sister. I'll send you a $5 bill, special delivery. None of these phone booth calls could be traced. Neither could the subsequent letter to McGilly's mortuary, its address carefully printed by pen and ruler. Enclosed was $25. A similar missive with money reached the florist. Inside was a card, and his handwriting obviously disguised to go with the flowers. Leave for East, Louise. These melodramatic developments tauntingly brazen drove the Kansas City authorities to new furies of endeavor. A love vendetta seemed evident. Louise was the jilted. Owen, supposedly faithless, had been decoyed into a trap and vengefully slain. Detectives serving as pallbearers guarded the funeral. Others disguised as grave diggers watched the cemetery for days, but nothing happened. Two years went by. Then, in November 1936, Miss L. E. Ogletree of Birmingham, Alabama, saw a resume of the case published in the American Weekly with Owen's photograph. Mrs. Ogletree was shocked to recognize the portrait. The scar, result of a childhood burn, the features, stalwart build, no doubt about it, Ronald Owen was Artemis Ogletree, her son. Early in 1934, Artemis, then a 17-year-old high school student, had started to hitchhike to California, she said. Ample funds were sent to him while he was away. He wrote home regularly, apparently enjoying his holiday. Then, early in 1935, Mrs. Ogletree had received a typewritten letter signed Artemis, queerly, slangly, and unfamiliar, postmarked Chicago. In May, from New York, came a second note, telling her Artemis was going to Europe followed immediately by a special delivery saying he was sailing that day. The letter seemed spurious. Artemis had never before used a typewriter, and Mrs. Ogletree was suspicious and worried. Then, on August 12, 1935, she received a long-distance call from Memphis, Tennessee. A man, who gave his name as Jordan and explained that her son had once saved his life, said that Artemis was in Cairo, Egypt, and well. He called later to tell her Artemis had married a wealthy woman in Cairo and was unable to write because he'd lost a thumb in a barroom brawl. The speaker sounded irrational. Mrs. Ogletree sent her son's photograph to the Kansas City Police. Sergeant Holland identified the youth at once, and the grim fact was immediately evident. Mrs. Ogletree had received mystery phone calls and typewritten letters after Artemis was dead. Was the purpose of this cruel deception to further cloak the slain youth's identity? Perpetrator of letters and calls has never been found. The mystery of room 1046 is still 
unsolved.